I'm Ann Howard Creel, and this is the story behind my stories. You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Margaret Wise, Terry Brooks, Sheena Kamal, Matthew Quick, J.T. Ellison, Walt D. Williams, Brad Ford, Corey, Dr. O. Robin Mock, Ernest Klein, Tim Butcher, Sherwin Harris. Visit HankGarner.com for archives of all the shows. Today's guest is... Anne Howard Creel. Thanks for tuning in to Author Stories. You can find archives of all of the shows at hankgarner.com. And when you're there, look over in the right-hand sidebar and subscribe to the show. It's free to subscribe on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher Radio, now Spotify, YouTube, and anywhere you listen to podcasts. That's hankgarner.com. I'd like to tell you about a few folks before we get into today's interview. Uh, Ernie Howard has a new book up for pre-order. It's called Melody 8. My mother used to sing to me when I was scared at night. She would lay beside me and I would place my head on her chest, hearing the song through the vibration of her body. I loved my mother's voice right up to the day she was put to death because of it. If you're a lover of post-apocalyptic stories, you need to get ready for a new twist on the genre. We must change the vibration or the frequency will forever change us. Melody 8. Pre-order it now from Ernie Howard. Soul Breaker by Clara Colson is free right now. There's a dangerous monster loose on the streets of Aurora, Michigan, and Detective Cal Kinsey is determined to stop it or die trying. Two years ago, Cal Kinsey was an up-and-coming cop in the Aurora Police Department, but during a fateful nighttime stakeout in search of a prolific killer, Cal witnessed the darkest corner of his dreams come to life. A rogue vampire slaughtered his partner and introduced Cal to the supernatural world he never knew existed in the shadows. Soul Breaker is free now from Clara Coulson. There's a link to it in the show notes. Also by August Anzel, After the Pretty Pox, The Attic. A searing act of bioterrorism, a catastrophic plague they call the Pretty Pox. Most of the human race is dead, and for two years, Ari McInnes has been alone, writing out the aftermath of the disease. Hidden in the attic of her ruined home, Ari survives by wit and skill, ritual and habit. Convinced that humans are little more than a dangerous fluke of nature, she chooses solitude, even in matters of life and death. Ari's precarious world is upended when her youngest brother, a man she's never met, appears out of nowhere with a badly injured woman. Their presence in the attic draws the attention of a dark watcher in the woods, and Ari is soon forced to choose between the narrow ideas that have sustained her and a stubborn instinct to love and protect. In book one of August Anzel's captivating post-apocalyptic series, After the Pretty Pox, cast an unwavering eye on what it means to be human in a world where nature has the upper hand, and the only rules left to live by, for good or ill, are the ones written on our hearts. After the Pretty Pox, The Attic. There's a link to it in the show notes. Now on to our show. Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Today, I'm really excited to have Ann Howard Creel on the show with me today. She has a fantastic new book uh, called The River Widow that, uh, when you're hearing this, is out everywhere, and I'm super excited to talk with you about it today. Uh, welcome to the show, Ann. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And we begin each show with the same question, and that question is, what is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or storyteller? Well, I was very young. Um, I think it started when I was given a diary as a as a gift for either a birthday or Christmas. And I, you know, I really looked forward to it. I started making it a part of my day. I wrote in it at night. And, um, but the, the biggest thing that happened was when I was about seventh grade and my father had one of those old black typewriters, manual typewriters with the round keys and things stuck together. And he was, he was throwing it out uh, along with a metal typewriter table that they had back in those days. And he was kind of wheeling it down the hall past my door. And I said, Oh no, 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 don't throw that away. I'll take it. And 
that's I started typing uh, out my first story on that old manual typewriter. Oh, I love it. There, there's something about the tactile feeling of of making a story on a typewriter, isn't there? Yes. I mean, that was all there was. And we <laughs> accepted that the keys would stick together sometimes and things. And as I said, it was already old when I got it. But, yeah, I loved it. It was one of my most prized possessions. That that is something that uh, that people now can't appreciate. That you you get so excited about a story and you start typing too fast, and and uh, two or three of those keys would hit at the same time and stick, and you're like, oh god. Yeah, yeah. You really had to uh, stop and untangle them. It seems very archaic now, <laughs> but it really happened. I know I, that's something I haven't thought about in so long, and I just get this mental image when you say that. It's just put a big smile on my. Face. That's uh, that's amazing. Um, what kinds of stories did you love? Uh, you know, I I loved, uh, of course, like Nancy Drew mysteries, um, really dating myself. But there was also another um, trilogy of books called, you know, like the Palomino Tales. And it was about a girl who um, got a horse, a Palomino. And that had been my dream as a girl. So. I just devoured those and read them over and over and found other things I liked at the library. But it was really pretty much the typical stuff that girls were reading at that time. Gotcha. Gotcha. Um, what were those first stories that you started writing? What, what were the, the what were the things that captured your imagination? Well, that first one was about, you know, a girl in junior high. You know, um, I'm sure it was very autobiographical at the time. Yeah. Um, I don't remember. I mean, it was kind of a love story and a friendship story and, you know, nothing special. I'm sure I wish I had it just <laughs> to read it back. I, I think I wrote about a hundred pages and just nice. <laughs> relive the teenage angster uh, or preteen. I guess I was about 12 at the time. But it has been lost somewhere along the line. I haven't seen it in a really, really long time. Did was there was there anyone in your life, a parent, a teacher, anything that uh, uh, that saw that gift in you and that desire to write and encouraged you? Um, not a whole lot. I mean, I had a great um, fourth grade teacher uh, who really liked me, but I was, I was very quiet. I was pretty shy and I, you know, I made good grades, but I didn't really stand out in that way. Um, I just, you know, was one of those people that didn't want to call a lot of attention to myself. Gotcha. Um, when, uh, when you moved through school, um, did you, did you hold this thing, um, this desire to, to be a writer, uh, as you age, did, did that ever leave you? Uh, you know, a, a lot of us have these early desires and then we get caught up with life and, and all of this and we kind of put it on a shelf for a while. Uh, or, or was this something that kept burning inside you? It always kept burning inside me, but I never, as a young person, I never considered it as a vocation. Um, my parents were, a teacher and a professor. They had grown up during the Depression. They had been young people during World War II. And the message that was always sent to me and my sisters, you know, it was very well-meaning, but it was to do something practical. And in those days, it was to be, you know, a teacher or a nurse or something like that. And um, so I never thought about even getting a journalism degree. I went to college and did pre-nursing and a nursing degree and don't regret that at all. I did it for um, 20 plus years and it was a great profession. It was very good to me and did everything that it you know was intended to do. It was a great profession and it was also a very secure profession. But that urge to write did not ever leave me. It was buried for a very long time with working and raising children and living, you know, a busy life, but it was always there. So what was the thing that brought it back to the surface for you? 
it was really finally having some time. Um, I was finally able to work part time instead of full time. And just a little bit of extra time. I was kind of living in the mountains in Colorado in a place that was, we actually didn't have TV the first year we lived there. And um, it was kind of nice. It was a very different way of living with never having that, you know, television on. And it made me get more into my own head because I wasn't watching things on television. Or, and I read a lot more. And so my kids were young, and that led me to want to write children's books because I was sharing books with them that were aimed at, you know, like a middle grade audience, and they were so good. They were so good. They were, you know, inspirational. And I thought, yeah, I wonder if I could do this. I'm going to try. That's awesome. So what was the first book that you that you wrote? I wrote a book called Water at the Blue Earth, which is um, the English translation of a, of a spring in Colorado um, that had been sacred to the Native Americans. And it's a historical fiction book for like middle grades, uh, readers. And it's basically about a girl who comes to live um, at one of the early forts with her father, who was a soldier, and her mother, and about the friends and the experiences um, and that she has and the things that she witnesses as things begin to change. Gotcha. Um, did How long did it take you to write that story? You know, it took me... Maybe a year. There was a lot of research involved. And, it, and then it took another like two years to actually see it published. I did not have an agent. I did it on my own. Um, and it was published by a Colorado publisher called Roberts Reinhardt. And um, they first lost the manuscript. I had, you know, <laughs> when I, they really did. I, I, I oh, no. you know, they said they remembered receiving it, but couldn't locate it, and would I send it again, which, of course, I did, but it started the process all over again. Mm. Wow. Um, so I, I guess that ultimately got, got resolved, and, uh, and and the book made it out to the world? It did, and that was just a complete thrill. And at the time, I thought that that was all I would want to do, was just the satisfaction of telling one story and seeing it in print and hoping that children loved it. But lo and behold, I found out that that wasn't all I wanted to do, that I wanted to write other stories as well. Right, right. And, and, and you, uh, you learn that pretty quickly, don't you? That, uh, it, it, you get that initial satisfaction and you get about a week to sit and enjoy it. And then another story starts nagging at you, doesn't it? Right, right. You just, I think once, once you've done it, you want, you have that urge, you know, you remember how rewarding it was and you want to do it again. Right, right. Um, so what, what did you follow that up with? Um, the next thing I did was actually contemporary fiction. Um, for um, the American Girl um, Company, they um, they made dolls, and they were an yeah. independent company then. They're now owned by Mattel, but they were all accompanied with a book. And they were actually branching away from that and wanted to try some standalone titles. And I was one of the first... Um, three that they they did that with and it was contemporary it was inspired really by some work I was doing in Denver with homeless and street youth I was making you know some kind of horrible lunch on Tuesday but I knew what they would eat and I would do it and you know so this story just came to me you know of a, a girl who was you know living on the streets for a while and then ends up in a shelter like the one that I was volunteering at. Um, you have uh, gone on to write uh, adult novels, young adult novels, middle grade novels. 
when you start a project, do you, do you know who your intended audience is going to be? Uh, or does a story idea come to you and it kind of works itself out for who it's intended for? I think the story comes to me, but now really the stories that are coming to me are for an adult audience. And, and I think it's probably because, you know, my children are grown. I'm not reading children's books very often anymore. There's just so many things to read. I wish I could. I wish I could read it all. Right. Um, but I can't. And I, I'm at this stage really enjoy, you know, reading adult fiction and historical fiction in particular. And so I think that's why I'm drawn to write it is because I love reading it. Um, your, your latest book is called The River Widow. Um, and, and it's a fascinating read. Uh, but, but tell us a little bit about your, your entry into these, uh, adult novels that you're doing now. What was, what was it that intrigued you and, and how different uh, was it shifting gears away from the stuff you previously did into the stuff that you're doing now? What it always starts with with me, uh, or almost always, I should say, is is history itself. Something that I learn about, you know, an event um, in the past that for some reason just sort of fascinates me. And I was still in Colorado at the time. I was studying Colorado history. And, you know, I learned a, a true story about Um, There was a Japanese internment, a Japanese-American internment camp in Colorado, and um, the the people who were held there were used kind of as farm labor around there because most of the men were off at war, and something really happened between um, some Japanese-American women and some German POWs who were also, believe it or not, held in Colorado and were used as farm labor. And these Japanese-American women actually aided in the escape of these prisoners and were caught. And it was buried, you know, almost no one remembered it anymore, even out in Otero County where it happened. And the story just, you know, came to me based on that true story and that's usually what happens to me is that I I find something and you know in history and then that makes me start to visualize fictional characters to witness what happened and get involved in what happened and so that's what happened the first time is what happened with the river widow too when you when you find this historical nugget this this story uh that's uh maybe been overlooked or uh this this uh, uh you know the great thing about historical fiction is we get to find um a uh, a nugget a, a kind of a a bit of a story within the story that gets overlooked and maybe people are not familiar with and then allows us to to take a deeper look into these things that really happened. Uh, w- when you find something like that and you say, Oh, this is going to make a great story. Um, how do you then begin to build, um, the, the, the unknown story around that? So, so say we have uh, a historical happening and we know that, um, that there were characters involved, but we don't really know anything about the characters. How do you then start building these characters? Uh, uh, you know, that almost fictional characters, but within a, a true life happening. Well, again, I, it's, uh, I wouldn't say it's, um, a vision of any sort, but, so, but kind of an image starts to form in my mind when I'm imagining these events. And, you know, it, I write about female characters. And so some character begins to emerge and, I start writing down my thoughts and, you know, making notes and thinking about it further. And, you know, the real test is, can I turn this into a complete story, you know, with a beginning and a middle and an end? And um, sometimes I have had an idea that I thought was a really good premise, but I couldn't come up with the rest of it. So I had to let it go, Um, you know 
put, keeping those on the back shelf because I have had ideas come to me later. But I find that the ones that are the easiest and turn out the best really come together pretty quickly for me. And I see the story all the way through, not the details, but just the basic outline of it. I see it all the way through before I start writing. You, you write these stories with really, um, strong female characters and, uh, and these really compelling stories. Um, what is it about a character? Uh, that, that first intrigues you. What is it that, what do you see in a character that makes you go, Oh, this is, this is a story I have to tell? You know, I think I read this somewhere. So it's not my original thought, but that, you know, a character can be sympathetic. Um, even if they're not really a very, what would look on the outside a nice person, but if they, you know, because we, you know, we read about people involved in crime and all sorts of things that we still care care about those characters if the author has made us feel that way. And so I usually see something that, the, you know, the character really wants or cares about or needs. And um, that also a sense of humanity that, you know, they do care about something like that's happening in this event, this time period that they live in that makes them, you know, also care about things beyond themselves. And it's usually that kind of inner desire or character or goal that um, starts the whole process of developing that character in all the ways I can. Um, are you a, a, a planner, uh, or, uh, or are you a discovery writer? Do, do you plot out your novels first or do you discover them as you write? I wish I were the discovery kind. I, <laughs> I just, I read about that. I read about authors who say all they have is, you know, a line or a care or one character and they sit down and the words just start pouring out and, Everything starts to evolve and just naturally. And, you know, I can't do that. I have to admit, I had some of those story ideas before, as I mentioned before, and experimented a couple of times with taking what I had and starting to write and, you know, seeing if something more came and it didn't. So for me, I wish it weren't this way, but if I can't see I don't have it planned out, you know, in much detail, but if I can't see, you know, some clear steps ahead and, um, you know, things coming to a climactic point and there being some kind of, you know, resolution and closure at the end, then I've kind of learned not to write it. It's a lot of time to do the research for historical fiction and right. just putting any words down on the page and revising them so many times as I do, it, it takes too long for me to run up against a wall and not be able to finish it. Right. Right. Um, you say that you, you revise a lot and there's a lot of time spent in the revision process. What, uh, how many, do, do you have a certain number of times that you go over the manuscript or are you looking for certain things when you go over, uh, kind of what's your motivation, uh, in, in revisions? Well, it, it changes in the beginning. I know that my, I write a chapter and I know, and I don't stop to edit, self edit or anything. And I know it's going to be very rough. In fact, kind of awful. So it really is. And so the first time I'm just trying to, you know, ask myself, is there something here? Can I salvage it? And I've done it enough times now that I feel pretty confident most of the time that I can, but it's uh it's very bare bones and and not very good in the beginning so excuse me at first it's just to get it into the condition that I can really start you know fine tuning and revising and I you know it takes me several times through that chapter before I feel like it sort of shifts and I feel like 
okay, this chapter is working, but I still need to sharpen dialogue or I need to have a few more, you know, glimpses into character here or whatever it might be. Um, but I couldn't count how many times I read my manuscripts. I read them until I cannot read them anymore. I'm so sick of them. <laughs> I think we all know that feeling when, when you're, you're just like, Oh God, get this away from me. Um, but how do you know when it's finished? You know, that, that's a, that's a problem that a lot of people have is the kind of wanting to revise, uh, uh, forever. Uh, or some people have the, the opposite problem and, and one or two drafts and, and they're like, okay, I'm good. Um, so how do you know as the writer who's so close to the story, uh, when the thing is ready to be turned over, you know, to your editor or, uh, you know, whatever the next step is in your process? Well, I think one of the keys for me, and I think for a lot of people, is to set it aside for a while. Um, I also help aspiring authors um, with their manuscripts, and I almost always tell them, at, you know, after the first edit, to, to sit it aside for a while and, and just think about it, because you are too close to it sometimes. And, you know, when I've read it through... And I'm not really making many changes anymore. I always make changes. You can't read it through without making some kind of an adjustment here or there. But when I'm doing that less and less, I try to put it aside for about a month. And you're never going to gain true perspective on something that you've written. But that time, you know, reading other books, doing other things, living your life, you know, getting outside, talking, going on a trip or something – allows me at least to come back to it with a little bit more fresh eyes. And at that point, um, I'll either see a whole lot more that needs to be done or I'll think, you know, well, I'm pretty satisfied here. I think it's almost done. Um, and that's, a uh, that's something you just learn through doing it a lot. Isn't it? Yes. I, I was not able to self edit, hardly at all when I first started. And I think it's a skill that you do begin to learn and, and get better at as you go along. What, one thing that, that I, I've noticed is the, the more you do it, uh, the, the less, the less precious it becomes. And uh, e even though these are your words and your story and these characters mean so much to you, um, the more you do it, the more you're able to, to kind of realize what what is special about these characters and special about the story and and what can be trimmed and and cut and enhanced and and made better it's a that, that's just a confidence that just comes with writing a lot isn't it yes and i agree you're not as attached to your words later on as you were when you were a first time author um i've always been willing to cut and trim and um, most of the time I need to expand, but sometimes I do also need to cut and trim and I just don't mind it so much anymore. Uh, if I think I've written something, some really good passage, I might save it in another document and see if I feel differently about it later. But otherwise I just cut stuff and let it go. It's part of the process. Right, right. Let's let's talk about your new book. It's called The River Widow. Uh, when people are hearing this, uh, it's available everywhere uh, in uh, Kindle and a hardcover uh, audio book. Um, and uh, it's it's set in 1937. Um, we know that you love historical fiction, um, but there's this character, Ada Branch, uh, and uh, there, there's a flood approaching. Um, tell us about Ada, where she comes from, and what the scenario is that finds us in the river. Well, again, the idea for the book came from history itself, and I'm living in Kentucky now, sort of in the um, bluegrass, um, more horse country of Kentucky, although I've never become a horsewoman, as was my childhood dream. That never happened. But I was just interested in, in, in writing something about the state that I've sort of adopted. And 
So I was reading about Kentucky history and read about this flood of 1937 and how massive it was, how destructive it was, how huge it was. And, you know, it didn't affect the part of Kentucky where I live, but um, all along the Ohio River, you know, Louisville and Paducah, it was it was devastating. And I an image, you know, I was reading about this flood and an image just started to form in my head of this woman, like dragging her husband's body to the river. And I'm not spoiling anything. This happens in the first chapter. Right. But, um, you know, I don't know why it's the, it's the darkest thing I've ever written. And I'm not, you know, I'm not going through a dark period in my life or anything like that. I don't know. It's just what occurred to me. And, you know, I saw her as this, person who had um, just put up with enough. She'd had a hard life, but she was very smart and scrappy. And she fought back for the first time and made a heinous mistake. She she killed him accidentally. And again, this is all in the first chapter. And what was she going to do about it? And that, you know, started the book off and You know, I told something about her backstory, but it really mostly flows straightforwardly from there on. Well, what's uh, what's really fascinating is when you when you set a story in 1937 and you have these uh, these this inciting incident that that gets us you know going in the story. Um, Ada has an interesting journey because. uh, the world was a very different place then. And, uh, when, when you have an occurrence like this, um, and, and being, being a woman, uh, going through this, she's met with very different circumstances than she might be today. Right. And, um, you know, I know this type of, you know, domestic abuse and things go on now and there's nothing to say that it, it is any, less harmful now than it was in those days. Um, it's always not right. So I'm not saying that at the same time, the options that, and that were available to women back then were almost non-existent and, you know, people didn't believe them or they didn't want to hear it. They didn't, you know, they didn't want to know. They turned a blind eye. So there was a helplessness there that I'm sure women still feel today, but they, in those days, were on their own, for sure. And so that was another thing that fascinated me about it, I was thinking about, I didn't live through those times, and um, not very many people alive today, um, you know, did, it was so long ago, but um, just to illuminate that um, women had even fewer rights and and options back then than they do today. Right, right. Uh, what's great about this book is you're able to tell this really powerful story and make some great statements about the way the world was uh, compared with the way the world is now. And we get to look at um, – it may be the way that we wish the world would be, um, that, that we've come a long way, but maybe we haven't come far enough. Uh, and, and couching a story in a, uh, in, in a great situation like you have with these great characters allows us to kind of wrestle with these ideas, um, while not exactly feeling like we're wrestling with this huge, important situation where it's an entertaining read. Um, and, and, um, so you, you get to talk about things without being preachy, uh, and, and, and turning people off. Is that ever something that you're conscious of when you're writing that, uh, okay, maybe I'm, I'm a little on the nose here. Maybe I need to find a different way to say that. Or, uh, is that something that ever comes into your mind? It does. I try to be careful. I'm not trying to send, you know, a strong, you know, moral lesson or something. I write primarily to entertain. And if people get something out else from it, that's, that's great. But I find that just, um, you know, the very simplest thing, you know, showing what somebody went through instead of, you know, talking about it or placing judgment on it is just, just tell the story the way it was or the way you saw it. And, 
people will form their own opinions and you know some seem obvious and others don't um you know when when i was thinking about this i i it occurred to me would there be some readers who actually found um the branch family who are i guess the quote unquote sort of bad guys in this book would readers find at least something sympathetic about them and i thought that was a really good question that i'd love to ask a group of readers someday for sure for sure um the the river widow is, is this uh you said this was one of the darkest things that you've written and and that you were not going through a dark period this is just the way the story showed up um i i uh some of my my great friends are, are horror writers and sometimes I read some of their stuff and I, and I say, you know, you're a very well adjusted person. How did this story come out of you? Um, you know, we have a laugh about it. Um, but, but sometimes, uh, that's just the way the story shows up is, uh, do, do you feel any, any certain inspiration or anything when a, when a new story comes? Do, can you tell where these stories come from? Not really. I, all I can say is at that, um, you know, I'm evolving as a writer. My, my, of course, my children's stories had, you know, pretty happy endings. And then my first novel, the one I was talking about, about the Japanese American, um, uh, internment camp in, in Colorado and the surrounding area, that was, actually made into a Hallmark Hall of Fame movie. This was back when nice. they were shown on CBS. There was no Hallmark channel back then. They were they were much um I more expensively that. produced and they showed they showed once a quarter, um, once a season on Sunday nights on CBS. And you know, the the screenplay writers did take some liberties in making it a much more happy ending mine was a little bit more bittersweet but it was still the kind of movie that was attractive to hallmark hall of fame and you know i love what they do but i didn't want to keep telling that same story sure i once had my editor um at viking who that's who published that first novel told me once when i was kind of struggling with what to write next and she said you know it's really difficult to do the same thing well two times in a row. And that really stuck with me, and I started to let, allow myself to see other kind of stories. And um, so I think my books, um, the plots have become more complex. The characters have been more multidimensional. There's been, uh, you know, just a little bit more... Um, complexity that I probably didn't have the courage to go into as much as I do now since I've written uh, more novels. Right. Um, the new book is called The River Widow, uh, and I absolutely love what you're doing. Um, this book is fantastic, and I, I know it's it was picked as an Amazon first read uh, for November, and it's already getting a lot of buzz and a lot of uh, great positive reaction from people that are getting an early read of it. Um, it if uh, so, we we wish you uh, a lot of success with the uh, with the book, and it's already a number one new release in historical fiction, even before it releases to the to the general public. So that's really exciting. Um, if people are just learning about you and your work, um, where can they find you online to dig in more and find out about all you do? I have a website www.annhowardcreel.com. Um, I have a a Facebook page, um, and that's Ann Howard Creel. And um, I've started doing Instagram. I don't do a whole lot with it yet, but um, there's a means to contact me through my website. And I love to visit book clubs via Skype. So uh, let me know if anyone wants to do that or just wants to drop me a line. I'd love to hear from you. Nice, nice. Uh, Anne, I've really enjoyed talking with you today. We're going to send everyone to pick up a copy of The River Widow, and uh, we'll link everything up in the show notes. Thank you so much for taking time to come on the show today. Well, thank you for having me. I enjoyed it very much. 
Writing novels is hard, but Dabble makes it easier. Dabble replaces your word processor, doing what it can't. Dabble organizes your manuscript, story notes, and plot. It simplifies story, leaving more room in your brain to create. And after all, that is what being a writer is all about. Dabble was built from the ground up specifically for writing novels. It takes minutes to learn, and it makes writing a joy. See how Dabble will revolutionize the way you write with a free trial at www.dabblewriter.com. Thanks for listening to the Author Stories Podcast. You can find archives of all of the shows at hankgarner.com, and when you're there, please subscribe. Up next is an audiobook clip from Richard Gleaves, the Jason Crane series. On Walpurgis night, when the moon is high, hell's bells ring and witches must answer. They dapple their breasts with rendered fat of murdered babes, straddle their brooms and take to the sky as the devil wills to speed through dreamy midnight air to the summit of the Brockenberg, that haunted peak shrouded in swirling mists, where a glen of gnarled limbs and wan moonlight awaits to host their debauches and blasphemies. Now to the Brocken the witches ride, the stubble is gold and the corn is green, there shall the carnival sabbat be seen, and the devil shall come to preside. The accuser elopes from the bowels of hell, a sure-footed, goat-headed, many-horned beast with cloven hooves and a staff of bone. He perches upon the witch altar to brood in cerulean half-light, a winged silhouette with watchful red eyes. The witches gather and bow to their master, upon his charred rump give the shameful kiss, then imps beat the drum and a round dance begins. Lash yourselves into frenzy, hags. Pass the chalice of pure marrow broth. Whip the ground with your hair. Tread the sky with your feet. Dance with joined hands around Satan's cold fire. Then find out a nook of nettles and moss and lay with the rough-skinned beast of your choosing, suckling some rancid teat of desire. But hist! The cock crows. Away, away. Gather your tatters and broomsticks and wits. Back to your huts, to your thresholds and hearths. And become once more, at the red break of day, the furtive adder in your neighbor's garden. The ghost host of the Salem Sorcery Tour, dazzling in his steampunk Victorian morning crepe, let the spell he'd woven trail through the twilight air like a hag across the moon, then chirped, isn't that silly? And bowed, sweeping the wet grass with his satin-ribboned top hat. The tour group gave a polite round of applause. Nobody believes that stuff today, but the Puritans sure did. They took witches very seriously. If they went down in the morning and bought eggs, and one was rotten, surely the devil had come in the night, gone boop, tee-hee-hee, then scampered off on his little hooves. And who's in league with the devil? Witches. We're taught that the Puritans were super nice and cute with little buckles on their hats, but it's not the case, folks. They were fanatics. Witch hunts don't happen in a healthy society. They hated kids. They hated women. They were crazy. And that craziness. He turned on the spot, casting a protective circle around the stone garden of the witch memorial. Got these people killed 